The following program presents principles designed to promote good health. It should not take the place of personal professional care. Viewers should always consult their qualified health practitioner before considering alternative treatment. Good evening everyone and I'm glad that you're here tonight because what you're going to learn tonight is how to look after your heart. The, the proverb says keep the heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. How can we keep the heart with all diligence? I'm going to be looking at a couple of things tonight. I'm going to show you how to keep the heart with all diligence, but I'm going to also show you about the issues of life. What do you think the issues of life is? The issues of life is the blood that's of course being pumped by the heart. And when our heart stops, we stop. So there are many things that you can do that can keep that heart strong. The heart is a muscle. And that muscle is continually beating. And that heart muscle is made up of a whole lot of little cells. So to understand how the heart runs, to understand what it needs, to understand what weakens it, to understand what strengthens it, we need to go to the CBD, the Central Business District of the Human Body, so here is our cell and this week we've been looking at the glucose coming in. Last night we looked at insulin and we had a look at the fact that insulin is the key that unlocks the door to get the glucose into the cell. And once the glucose goes into the cell, it goes through a 20 step pathway. And that 20 step pathway gives us two units of energy. That's why we eat, isn't it? so that it breaks down in our gut, gets transported to the liver, which sends it to the cell. Now the end result of the 20 step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into the powerhouse. Called the powerhouse because this eight step pathway delivers to us an amazing 36 units of energy. What makes the difference? How come an eight step pathway gives us 36 units of energy and a 20 step pathway only gives us two units of energy? It's oxygen. So you could call this pathway an aerobic pathway because it uses oxygen, whereas this pathway is an anaerobic pathway because it doesn't use oxygen. So obviously, by looking at this, if our heart muscle, which is made up of all these little, specifically we'll look at muscle cell, if it's getting enough oxygen, can you see that it is gonna be stronger? Can you see that it is gonna pump more efficiently? So how can we ensure that, that, that our cells are getting enough oxygen? Well, there's a few ways that you can ensure that the heart is getting enough oxygen, and that is by the way that you breathe. Our body was designed so that our abdominal muscles were used in the breathing process. When you use your abdominal muscles in the breathing process, then you are getting full oxygen quotient. And many people today have a hunchback, many people have poor posture, and also, many people have tight clothes. You should be able to put your fist in your skirt or your pants, allowing those abdominal muscles to go in and out with the breathing process. Now, one of the reasons why people um, don't have a strong back, don't have good posture, is because their abdominal muscles are weak. You see, our abdominal muscles are basically like our, our core muscles. And you ask any... Uh, massage therapists, they can tell the strength of the human body by the strength of the core. So it's very important to have good core muscles because good core muscles mean that our spine is a little straighter and when our spine is a little straighter and our shoulders are back, we can use our abdominal muscles in the breathing process. 
So it's a little bit what f comes first, the chicken or the egg, but really what comes first is those strong abdominal muscles. One lady said, well, my, my core muscles are long gone. I said, well, if you were, you'd be standing like this because it's our core muscles that cause us to stand up straight. And every one of our abdominal muscles is linked to our spine. That's why when you strengthen those muscles, you automatically pull your spine up straight, allowing your abdominal muscles to be used in the breathing process. Many people have become high chest breathers. The Framingham study, which is a study I looked at last night, a little town of Framingham, over 30 years, 25,000 people, so it's a very reputable study. They found by the age of 50, people had lost 40% lung capacity. And we can use the, the old saying in many areas, and we're going to use it in our brain on Saturday morning, that if you don't use it, you will lose it. And our lungs have got, I think, should have about 300 million little tiny alveoli, and those little alveoli is where the gaseous exchange takes place. To to, so to ensure that we have adequate oxygen so that our cells can get down to here, because if we don't have adequate oxygen, some of our cells are going to run up there. How much energy is that going to give us? Not very much. So very important to strengthen those abdominal muscles. How can you do that? Exercise, you must exercise every day. Are you, are you familiar with Pilates stretches? You can Google Pilates, you can get a Pilates DVD, you can actually go to a Pilates class in most cities every uh, once a week and start to strengthen those abdominal muscles. You wouldn't think I would be going to be talking to you about abdominal muscles abdominal muscles when I'm talking about the heart. But to get those lungs open wide, we need to be using our abdominal muscles so they're strong, so they hold that spine straight so you can use them with the breathing process. Now, another reason why many people don't have full lung capacity is because they don't exercise. Last night, I touched on the interval training. What I want to do tonight, I want to go one step further and show you why the interval training is so powerful in strengthening that heart muscle. So let's have a look at the interval training. We'll go over it again for the people who weren't here last night and for the people who were here last night so we can recap it. Interval training, as the name implies, is intervals of high intensity and intervals of recovery and it's usually done for a cycle. Now, how long you do high intensity depends basically on your fitness level. And most of the uh, research that he's done with interval training is usually 20 or 30 seconds high intensity. That's running as hard and as fast as you can, or cycling as hard as and as fast as you can, or doing push-ups as hard and as fast as you can, or swimming as hard and as fast as you can. It's not very long. Only, uh, let's, let's put in a 20 second, we'll be kind to you. 20 seconds high intensity. That's about a 60 second recovery, usually done for a cycle of six. Now at our health retreat, a lot of people that come to us are not very fit. And I thought most of them cannot do a 20 or even 30 seconds high intensity. And then I heard of a talkback radio show that talked about this and they were doing seven seconds high intensity, 14 seconds recovery for a cycle of seven. I'm immediately interested because I'm a Bible student and if you look at numerology all through the Bible, the factor of seven comes up many times. And you look at the human body, seven holes in our hands, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 28 cycle in a woman's cycle, seven days in a week. The, the factor of seven is woven all through. So I love the seven number. I also knew that anyone can do a seven seconds high intensity. Now remember, this is going really hard and fast. In his book, Pace, Dr. Al Sears, he talked to a lady who was about a lady who was 58. She's very unfit. She did seven seconds high intensity and she needed 15 minutes to recover. Hmm. I tell you that because um, 
If you're that, <laughs> it's all right, because if you keep doing it every day, you will find that your recovery time will get less and less and less. And your fitness is not determined by how hard and fast you can go, but how long you take to recover. The reason why Dr. Al Sears book is called PACE, and the letters mean progressive, that's the P, progressive. Because as you do it, you will get fitter, you will get stronger, your recovery time will be less, you will be able to go further and further, um, further time and you'll be able to put more of the cycles into your interval training exercise. But the exciting thing about this, it is so quick. It's just a tiny little nugget of a day. You can actually do it for about 15 minutes a day. That's exciting, isn't it? Because most of us, and this is the biggest complaint I have at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, people say, well, I was exercising, but I just don't have time. You know, you don't have time not to do this. <laughs> if you want to enjoy the latter days of your life, you've got to start implementing this interval training. Because remember, we're, we're training for something more important than the Olympic Games. We're training for life. And we're training for those latter years of life. So let's have a look at pace. Progressive acceleration. You are moving. This is no gentle stroll. And this morning when Amelia and I were running up and down the hills, I think in the Bombay Hills, is that what they are? Um, there are times when we stop talking. And that's when we're running very, very fast. <laughs> so acceleration, this is no gentle stroll. And as Amelia said, you've got to get to the point where you feel like you're dying. Got that? You feel like you're dying. Because I know with myself, we usually do 30 seconds. When I get to 20 seconds, my body says, enough. But you push yourself. You push yourself that little bit further that little bit further and every day you'll go that little bit further. If you want to bring your, your fitness program down to 15 minutes, you're going to have to be working very, very hard. But it's just a little chunk and it makes an incredible difference for the whole day. And what are you putting into that muscle cell? What are you putting into that heart cell? You are delivering massive amounts of oxygen. I remember when I was a little girl, <coughs> I was in a family of seven and we all were real skinny and we squeezed into the little Morris Minor and sometimes we'd go to the bush and have a picnic and, and one day when we got in the car, the car wouldn't start. So Dad went out and got a jack handle and poked it in the front and wound up the engine, got it going, jumped in the car and off we went. We are right. Do you know that's what this does in the morning? It's like you're getting the jack, maybe it's a very old illustration. <laughs> and you're winding up that body and shoo, it'll run at a more efficient and effective rate all day long. That's why the morning is the best time to do it. So let's look at pace. Progressive acceleration cardiopulmonary. The C is talking about cardio. We have our fitness um, coordinator at our health retreat. His name is Howard. I think there are pictures of him on our website. He's 52 and all the guests think he's 35. <laughs> he's very fit, he is very strong, and he rides his bike to work every day and he rides up hills like this. <laughs> and his resting heart rate is 46. That's pretty low, isn't it? 46 beats per minute. I think Howard will still be working for us at the age of 90, <laughs> the way he's going. <laughs> he's, uh, the guests cannot believe this guy. And you know what he does for fun? So let's think about it. He wakes up the guests at six o'clock. So what time does he wake up to get the guests up at six? He must wake up at five. And he takes them through their exercise program. Then he goes home and he usually goes on another exercise routine with his wife and then he has breakfast and then he comes back later and he massages the male guests and in the afternoon, he, he lights the steam bath because our guests have a steam sauna down by the creek every afternoon where they get hot in the sauna, then they dive in the creek, back in the sauna. 
So he, he probably gets home about six at night. Now one evening, Michael and I are going to town. We're about an hour from town. And we're coming home from town. We're halfway home and it was dark. And we saw this light on the road. We thought, what's that? And we got closer. It's a cyclist. We got closer. It's Howard. For fun, after work, he goes and rides 20 k's on his bike. Wow. We've worked with Howard for 15 years. Do you know he's always the same? He's always exactly the same. Do you know what this tells you? This exercise, this pumping of oxygen right into the cell, this is happening in all your brain cells. This is actually affecting the way you think. It's affecting the way. It's affecting your mood. It's affecting every single part of your body because you think about it. We are just a bunch of cells. But these cells specifically that we're looking at tonight are the heart cells because that heart muscle is made up of muscle cells. So progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary. If you don't have a 46 beat per minute heart rate, do you know you can get it? You can get it. We may not all come up to the standard of the Olympic Games, the Olympic athletes, but we all can be fit. Howard's fitness is not genetics. Howard's fitness is because he works at it. And anything in life, you more the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. So progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary. What's pulmonary? That's the lungs. I've already touched on the lungs. And the only way to prevent losing 40% lung capacity by the age of 50, the only way to prevent losing 60% lung capacity by the age of 80 is to move those lungs every day. You got to get it to the point where you're literally heaving every day. And if you have lost lung capacity, you can regain it. So if, you, if you've lost it, you can regain it. If you haven't lost it, you can prevent losing it. That's the good news. And that's going to affect every cell in your body. It actually makes the difference whether you've got energy or haven't got energy. The bottom line is for chronic fatigue syndrome is just lack of oxygen. Because look at that. My cells got oxygen. How much energy have I got? 36 units of energy. Wow. Compared to two units of oxygen. So if you want to feel good, you've got to move. So progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion. There's your pace. You are exerting yourself big time. What I didn't tell you yesterday about this equation was the effect of this exercise on the cell. Now to, to understand this, we need to know that this process here or this 20-step this pathway is very fast. This 8-step pathway is very slow. And when you're getting to the end of your 20 or 30 seconds, high intensity, the 20 step pathway speeds up. The 8 step pathway speeds up. No wonder you're starting to move very fast. But when you start to go faster, a rate setting enzymes in there that will always have this pathway faster than this pathway. So when you're starting to move and move fast, you're going to produce more pyruvate than you can use. And so now the body stores it as lactic acid. Here's our lactic acid stores. You've heard of lactic acid? Mm -hmm. Now listen carefully because I think this is the most exciting part of this whole equation. When you're in recovery time, what's recovery? Now recovery might be... <sighs> It, it might be standing still, just getting your breath. In fact, we had a big hill this morning, and so halfway up, we stopped. And in our recovery time, we were doing some stretches. So recovery time might be still. Sometimes my recovery time is just going slowly down the hill. Often my recovery time, compared to running as fast as I can, is just walking. So depending on your fitness, depending how you feel after your high intensity, depends on recovery. 
If someone's really fit, their recovery time might just be <laughs> like this compared to going for it. In recovery time, your liver converts this lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. Do you know what this means? When you're in recovery time, <sighs> just standing still maybe, your cell is burning just as much fuel, just as fast as when you're running for your life. Isn't that good news? So when you're in recovery time, it's not an excuse because you can't go any further. It's necessary to mop up your lactic acid. Question, if someone goes on a 5K jog without stopping, what's happening to their lactic acid? It's building up, isn't it? It's building up. And tomorrow night, I'm going to show you the acid-alkaline balance in the body. We're going to look at foods that leave uh, acid ash in the cell. We're look, going to look at foods that leave an alkaline ash in the cell. Have you ever read stories in the newspaper? Al Sears has quite a few in his book about 45-year-old guy doing a 5K jog, kills over, dies, heart attack. Yeah. We've all read of the stories. And the couch potato says, hmm, look at that. Look at him. Didn't do him any good. So he stays on his couch. <laughs> do you know why that happens? Let me tell you. Let's say the man the night before had a very acid meal. What would be an acid meal? Ah, uh, steak, ah, uh, chips, ah, uh, bread, ah, uh, sugar, ice cream for dessert, maybe some red wine at the meal. All of those foods break down to acid in the cell, which we'll look at tomorrow night. He goes to bed, he gets up in the morning, he doesn't drink water, which is alkalizing. He drinks that, what is it, Gatorade or, you know, those high energy drinks. More acid in the cell. He's jogging along, the lactic acid's building up. What's happening there? We get a tip of acid at the cellular level. A tip of acid at the cellular level slows down the blood and he has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Whereas there is no known heart attack of a person in the middle of interval training. And you can see why, because in recovery time, what's being mopped up, students? The lactic acid. No wonder, no wonder the trainers are finding today that this interval training gives their athletes an edge. When they train with the interval training, their, tra their, their athletes have that extra little go, which is necessary, of course, to win the race, to break the gold. Was very popular, was be just becoming popular before the war. In Germany, a lot of trainers were doing this. In the war, a lot of things were lost. Then a Japanese trainer, he started doing it in about the 80s. In fact, in many uh, gyms, you can do, go through the Tabata protocol. Doug McGuff, he's another uh, doctor, cardiac surgeon, who started to put his patients on that with remarkable results. Doug McGuff says, when you start implementing this, we're not going to be able to hold you down because you're going to be, when can we start moving? <laughs> For the people with chronic fatigue, you say, do you exercise? What's the answer? Oh, you don't understand. <laughs> I don't have the energy. Guess how you get it? <laughs> And remember, you can start with seven seconds, <laughs> but you've got to push yourself a little bit more every day. And so interval training, that type of exercise is one of the most powerful ways to keep the heart with all diligence. So we're going to make a list of how to keep the heart with all diligence, and that's interval training. And remember, don't have time is no excuse. <laughs> We've got 24 hours in a day. Everyone's got that little bit of time. You've just got to make time. You've just got to make an appointment with yourself. So to keep the heart with all diligence, you've got to move that heart. And remember, it's going to get easier. Something else that's necessary for keeping the heart with all diligence, we did try to get this board clean. Oops, it's going, it's going. There's only one way you will not be able to 
do the interval training effectively, and that is if you're dehydrated. And the other thing that can really slow it down is if you have had breakfast, because it takes 1,200 calories to digest a meal. So when you're exercising, you've got a lot of movement happening in your stomach. And when you start exercising, the blood, need, the blood is needed in your muscles. So can you see there's a little bit of a, um, a, little bit of a war starts up. They start fighting for who's going to have the energy. So very important, number two, that you be well hydrated, water. The water loss in a day is about two and a half litres. That's 1.5 litres out through the kidneys, uh, 0.5 of a litre out of the skin, 0.3 of a litre out of the colon, and 0.2 of a litre out of your lungs. That's two and a half litres a day. So two litres must be replaced. The other half a litre can come through herb teas, maybe a juice, maybe your salad, maybe your fruit salad. You're getting some moisture there. But that water must be replaced. Keeping the heart with all diligence, those muscles need water because out of it are the issues of life and the best blood thinner is water. <laughs> but for us to access that water, we need sodium. Sodium in the form of whole salt. Now, let's have a look at the highest concentration of sodium on the planet is seawater. So seawater contains 92 minerals. And of those 92 minerals, 30% is made up of sodium and 50% is made up of chloride. Now, because they make up the largest amount of the minerals in the seawater, the first crystals formed when the water is evaporated from seawater is sodium chloride. And so what man does is he scoops that up, bleaches it white, puts aluminium with it so it runs freely. There's your table salt. And your table salt is a dangerous salt. It only has two minerals, sodium chloride. And if you were in inject sodium chloride straight into the veins, you would kill the person. They're very harsh minerals, those two. They need to be buffered with all the other minerals. The salt that we use is Celtic salt. And Celtic salt has 82 minerals. Where are the other 10? Well, they're in such pico proportion, barely measurable, that it's inevitable that they're lost in the evaporation process. But hey, 82's a lot closer to 92, isn't it? Now, in that Celtic salt, there are three magnesiums. So magnesium sulfate, there's magnesium bromide, and magnesium chloride. Mag magnesium is an incredibly important mineral in the human body. It's responsible for about 400 enzymic functions. Magnesium is very, very important in the heart because there are two minerals that cause that heart to beat. Well, there's a few, but basically these two. Calcium constricts magnesium relax, relaxes. Calcium constricts, magnesium relaxes. And so an important part of getting proper heart health, especially if someone has high blood pressure, is magnesium. Magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, which means it absorbs water into itself. And when you put Celtic salt in a bowl, on the table, and we have a lot of rain, you come and look at that salt and it'll be quite wet because it's absorbing the moisture out of the air. When you take a crystal of this Celtic salt and put it on your tongue, already the mucous membranes in the mouth are absorbing the minerals. It is taken in the blood to the cell and that magnesium causes the water to be drawn into the cell. It's the quickest way to hydrate the human body. Now, around the cell, there isn't one membrane, it's a bilayered membrane. And when the water rushes through the cell, 
into the CBD under the action of magnesium, a little motor is triggered in that membrane to start spinning and the spinning of that little motor gives us a unit of energy. So when everyone at work is going out to get their coffee or their cigarette to get a boost, you just get your crystal of Celtic salt, put it on your tongue, have a glass of water and you watch the little energy boost that you will get. And you won't get the drop like they will all get. They might get initial rise, but then there's always a corresponding drop. And I'll explain that process in a little bit more detail on Saturday morning. Quickest way to hydrate the body. The soils are mineral deficient today. The plants are mineral deficient today. And so doing this every glass of water is an excellent way to start to recover some of the minerals that so many people in New Zealand, Australia and America today are deficient in, especially the magnesium. Now there is one drink that leaches the magnesium and the calcium out of the body and that is caffeine. Now there was a bit of a groan last night when I mentioned this one. <laughs> I call it Australia's darling. Is it New Zealand's darling too? What's a darling? Something they love. And it's, it's very, very effective at leaching the calcium and the magnesium out of the body. And most people don't realise that that coffee is a huge contributing factor to dehydration, to heart malfunction and also to imbalance in heartbeats. So there are some things that have to stop if you want to keep the heart with all diligent and one of them is caffeine because of the way it leaches the, uh, the magnesium out of the body and as you can see by what I just described, magnesium is so important. Anyone that comes to me with high blood pressure, uh, we do quite a few changes but we always supplement with magnesium because it keeps that heart muscle at rest. You see your systolic is your high point and your diastolic is your bottom one. It relaxes that di diastolic and brings it down a little bit. And the Celtic salt can do that. But how often are people with high blood pressure told to what? No salt. Now there are three, well there are four vital elements needed for life. Let me, let me draw the four vitals. And you can find this in any anatomy and physiology book, any chemistry book. Number one is oxygen. Number two is water. Number three is sodium. Did everyone hear that? And check me out on that. Go to your anatomy and physiology book. And if you don't have an anatomy and phy physiology book, please buy one. We need to know about this house we're living in. The number four is potassium, and potassium is found in all your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're the four vitals el elements needed for life. So if anyone's told they should stop salt, it's very unscientific. It's incredibly unpractical. And what's a baked potato without salt? What's avocado and tomato on spelt sourdough bread without salt? Our palate tells us we need salt. Last night I quoted that verse in the Bible. It's Matthew 5 verse 13. Yeah, the salt of the earth, if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. How does salt lose its savour? This salt here with its two minerals has lost its savour. What's the savour? It's all the other minerals. There's a book on salt written by a French doctor named Dr. Lilangri. He says in France there is no issue on salt. In fact, he's surprised at the issue he sees made of salt in Australia, New Zealand, in America. He said, we don't have this issue in France because in France it's hand harvested salt. It is whole salt. You see, one extreme is table salt, the other extreme is no salt. They're both dangerous. We need to come in the middle. We need that balance. The body runs according to precision balance. You think about it. We cry seawater. We sweat seawater. Baby swims in seawater, in utero. We urinate seawater. 
Now, you don't have to taste your urine. You might taste your sweat. In fact, in the war, in the Navy, they used to transfuse with seawater if someone needed a blood transfusion because it's very quickly converted to blood. Seawater is called an isotonic solution because it's almost the exact same balance and proportion as is found in the human body. I don't suggest you drink seawater. It's not very nice. But you can take that crystal of Celtic salt before every glass of water. Dr. Robert Thompson, in his book, The Calcium Lie, he maintains it's impossible to overdo it. And he maintains that you need to do that every glass of water just to replace the minerals that you lost yesterday. Mm-hmm. If you're not used to salt, start slowly. <laughs> we have had guests that say, but I don't have any salt. Let me show you what's happening with no salt. Lining your gastrointestinal tract are villi. Villi look like this. And there's a little receptor site there. And the glucose comes down and comes into the receptor site because it's going to come into the blood. And in that receptor site, there's a carrier. And the carrier says, I will not accept you glucose unless you come with a molecule of sodium. Aha. Uh -huh. And if there's not enough sodium, that glucose cannot get in. That glucose ends up in the toilet. You can read that in the anatomy and physiology book. No wonder sodium's the third most vital element needed for life. I memorized this out of the anatomy and physiology book because I wanted to give it to you from the horse's mouth. Sodium is the main transport system of nutrients across the brush border and into the blood. We need it, but we need to have it the way it's found in nature. <coughs> And that is with all of its other minerals in its perfect balance. So we need the whole salt. How much do we need? As much as you can take. <laughs> it's not nice when there's too much salt in a meal, is it? And it's not nice if there's not enough salt. Your palate will tell you. Have you ever seen people using table salt and they put it on everything? before they even taste it. Do you know why? Because these two harsh minerals kill the taste buds. No wonder they have to put it on everything. It kills the taste buds. We need salt, but we need to have it in the way that it's found in nature, in all of its balance. So the, the water and the salt are very, very important. But the way to take the water into the body is little by little by little. Sip it. I never used to drink water. I was breastfeeding or pregnant non-stop for 14 years. So I am an expert on breastfeeding, child raising, childbirth, because I did it for so many years. And I helped many, many people because of my experience. But I didn't drink water. I didn't think I need to. I would just have a cup of tea or a cup of Echo or Caro. I thought I'm getting enough through my fruits and vegetables. Do you know I often used to get migraines and headaches? Whenever we travelled, I'd get headaches. I hated travelling in the car. I'd always get headaches. I got colds often and I'd get terrible sinus. And then I started to study the body. And then I started to study how much water we are. And then I started to look at what happens when you don't have the water. So I began to drink more water. Do you know I never get a headache now? I can't remember my last headache, so I should never say never, but it's very, very rare. I can't even remember my last cold. It was a few years ago. And when I do get a cold, I don't get any sinus problems. That is so nice. We have a book at our health retreat. It's called One of the Body's Many Cries for Water by Dr. Batman Geheljic. We'll just call him Dr. B. And another title to his book is, He's Not Sick, He's Thirsty. That was me. <laughs> another title to his book is, Don't Treat Thirst with Medications. Many are sick purely because of dehydration. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a not negotiable thing. You just got to find out how to get it in. Have the water in the car, have the water by your bed, have the water in the kitchen, have the water in your workplace. Sip, sip, sip. <laughs> 
And if you sip, 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 and if at the beginning of every glass you take a crystal of Celtic salt, you won't be running to the little house quite as much. And you can see why, because the water is going to get inside the cell. So it's absolutely essential that we be well hydrated. Keep the heart with all diligence, for out as it are the issues of life. We need to nourish the heart cell. Tomorrow night we're going to look in detail when we look at the acetyl alkaline balance on the best food. But let me just define the three essential food groups. So here we have the three essentials. We touched on this last night. One essential food group is fibre. Fibre is necessary, and we looked at this when we looked at diabetes, because it slowly releases the nutrients. And it's in the fibre part of food where you'll often get a concentration of your nutrients, specifically in the peels. Another essential is protein. Once you take the water out of the body, the next most prominent nutrient is protein. You cannot heal without protein. The new cell is built up with protein. And the other essential is fat. You see, 50% of this membrane around our heart cells is made up of protein, and 50% of the membrane around this heart cell, muscle cell, is made up of fat. But many people stop fat because of cholesterol. Am I right? Well, because it looks like I need to really clean my board <laughs> with soap and water, I'm going to give you a break. And after the break, I'm going to show you the whole cholesterol issue. And you might have seen the Catalyst show a couple of years ago where they showed that cholesterol does not cause heart disease. And I do have room to write this. There is a book you can get, and you might like to, buy, to write this down. It's an e-book called The Cholesterol Lie by Dr. Dwight Lundell. Now, Dr. Dwight Lundell is a cardiovascular surgeon, and he has performed 10,000 bypasses. Notice the book that he's written, The Cholesterol Lie showing that cholesterol is not what causes heart disease. There's another book called The Great Cholesterol Deception by Dr. Peter, uh, Peter Dingle. He's, uh, he's from Perth. And if you looked at the show on Catalyst, I don't know whether anyone looked at it on iView, last August, Fat or Fiction, it shows there that cholesterol is a non-issue. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. So I'm going to give everyone a break now and allow me to clean my board so it's nice and white again. And when we come back, I'm going to show you what cholesterol is and I'm going to show you how it works in the human body. Remember the old proverb, Proverb 14, verse 6, knowledge is easy to him that understands. Now, out the back here, there are tables with glasses of water with mint and lemon in it, very delicious. Amelia is out the back with, with our books and with some DVDs. So please have a break. Um, the time now is quarter to eight, so we'll come back at five to eight. And when you come back, we're going to have a look at cholesterol, and we'll also continue looking at how you keep the heart with all diligence. So please have a nice break. <laughs> 